Now, one thing I do want to mention here, that the content of this lesson is not designed to teach you research methods and designs, but to help you better understand how to present the content in Chapter 1. I don't have time here to be able to teach you research methods and designs and give you all the information you're going to need about how to write research questions and hypotheses. You should already have some basic knowledge on that. If not, then perhaps you haven't had enough research courses yet, or you have, and you need to go back and learn and relearn some of the information there. So I will share with you how to present your research questions and hypotheses. I will do a, some basic instruction about them, but I can't cover the whole content as you might expect to find in a research course. In talking about the research questions, what I'm talking about now is the section, the actual heading in chapter one, which will be titled research questions or research question if you only have one. I will go into why you may only have one and why you would have more in a few moments. But as you start this section or this heading in chapter one, you should start in with a lead in section, perhaps a paragraph or two that to describe what research questions are and their purpose. The idea here is to first inform the reader. The reader are other people who are going to read your work later. In some cases, it's your doctoral faculty members. It's the university and part of your work as an academic student who's doing that academic research work is to help your university people know that you know what you're talking about. So we need to know why you're putting your research questions or that you understand the rationale for them. Because remember, the doctoral dissertation is still a learning vehicle. And so there's information that would be in your study because it's an academic vehicle as compared to what I might do or others might do in research that's maybe more focused on grants or for the business setting. I probably wouldn't put this paragraph or two in those situations, but because you are an academic researcher at this point still, you should have a section, perhaps like I said, a paragraph, maybe two, that just talks about research questions, what their purposes are, and you could cite a few different subject matter experts if you prefer. If you look at a few other dissertations, you'll probably see some in there. I'm not saying you have to, I'm just recommending this as an idea to put in there. Some of my students do it, most of them will, some have not. And I'll even show you an example where somebody really didn't do any introduction as well. There should be no yes or no questions. Stay away from having research questions that can be answered with a simple yes or no. If you're looking at quantitative work, you're really looking at to what extent or to what degree something is happening between variables. If you're looking at qualitative work, you're looking more so for open-ended answers, perhaps what are somebody's lived experiences, or what do the stakeholders observe when something happened, perhaps in the past as in a case study where you're getting multiple views from people. And therefore, you can't answer your dissertation central research questions with a yes or no. If you have a yes or no, I'm not saying you shouldn't. There are examples, and I actually have one that I'll show you, but I'll refer to that example and suggest to you why it's more accurate than just a simple yes or no answer. So try to think more broad and particularly as I will mention when we talk about the research question themselves that there should be an alignment of your research questions to the research method and design. And when you do it as such, you'll realize that there's very little need or opportunity for a yes or no answer in the way you craft your questions. And just to keep things specific, the research questions I'm talking about here in this section are the central research questions for your study. They're not interview questions. Those are something completely different, whether they be survey questions or they're going to be interview questions that you might ask somebody in a qualitative study. Here we're focusing only on research questions. Research questions align to the research method and design. As I indicated, if you're going to do a correlation study, your research questions should be written as such where you're asking to what, if any, that there is a correlation between the independent and dependent variable. So ideally, as you start to get a better understanding of your research method and design, which that was another lesson in this series of the nature of the study, if you have that well-defined, then you can ensure that there's alignment. 
Matter of fact, just today I was looking at a proposal I'm a committee member for, and the most important thing I found is there was a lack of alignment between what was articulated in nature of the study for the research method and design, the purpose statement, and the research questions and the hypotheses because it's a quantitative study. These all have to be aligned. You may not understand all the connections yet, but the good thing is if you don't, you'll learn that along the way or as you'll find I am creating a bonus section that's going to go with this session and it's going to be me literally showing you how I will put each piece together much like a mind map and I'm actually going to record it while I'm doing it in a classroom same as I do when I have doctoral students with me face to face but getting back to the lesson here is you want to make sure your research questions align this is making sure that you have alignment throughout your study you may have heard that from some of your faculty members and this is what they're starting to refer to is to make sure that your research questions are aligned to your research method and design which is also carried into the purpose statement Terminology and word choices, they're critical. Again, you're thinking like the researcher, you're writing like the researcher. So there, you can't stipulate in a question what is the outcome of something. You want to be very specific, particularly if you're doing that quantitative study. To what, if any, is the correlation between? And this is where you start to look at that terminology and word choices to be specific and succinct. I believe that research questions, particularly for a doctoral dissertation, should be kept to a manageable number. Three are ideal. I'm not saying you can't have more. I've had a doctoral dissertation student who had 11 in a quantitative study, but that was because there were 11 individual factors for a program that she was assessing. There's nothing wrong with that, but remember, this is a doctoral dissertation, and it's about the academic exercise to teach you the basics of research the more convoluted you make it, the harder it's going to be on you. I'll give some examples in a few moments, but ideally for a quantitative study, if you have three independent variables to one dependent variable, that's a pretty easy study to be able to manage well and have enough information to make some inferences from later in your conclusions and recommendations. And perhaps some of the qualitative studies, in many cases, my doctoral dissertation students will have one question because that's all you need. So it depends on what you're doing, but let's just try to keep it more manageable. If you have more than three independent variables, then you may find that your work is a little unwieldy yet or may be able to benefit from some greater focus. Research questions should relate back to the specific problem somehow in some way. As I mentioned in the lesson on problem statements, we first create a general problem and then a specific problem. The specific problem relates to where your survey population is going to be. So your survey population would somehow get crafted into your research question, particularly when you're asking what the lived experiences are of people or you're doing your correlation design. You're looking at what's the correlation between independent and dependent variable in some sort of location and unit of analysis. So again, you'll start to see these connections happening more and more as you get deeper into chapter one with the sections coming together. So somehow, some way, anybody who reads your work should see a logical connection between your research questions and those stakeholders and the severity of the problem that you articulated in the problem statement. Now, if you haven't articulated a general and specific problem in the problem statement, you might want to go back and review that lesson that I created or work with your dissertation chair and reconsider how you might be able to do that better. Research questions may come before the conceptual framework, meaning that oftentimes we get the idea of the questions we want to ask before we get the ideas of what we want to write in chapter two. Oftentimes the conceptual framework is in chapter two. It's the ideas that are going to be brought about and written about in chapter two. Last session that I recorded was about the theoretical and conceptual frameworks where I did give some information on those and what the distinctions were. But here with the research questions, this may be able to help you then get the conceptual framework and get it started anyway, because once you ask the questions, you know what questions you want to ask, it's easier then to go that route into chapter two and create the boundaries or the major headings that you'll find in chapter two. 
because if, for example, you happen to create three research questions for each independent variable, then the conceptual framework of chapter two is really going to be designed around that independent variable first, maybe seven to nine pages there, then each of the three independent variables, and maybe five to seven pages for each independent variable. And then, of course, you would conclude the chapter with information about the relationship and interrelationships between the variables. So that approach gives you your conceptual framework or the ideas for chapter two. But that may also be the foundation of chapter two. But if you happen to gum about the other way and you have some ideas what you want in chapter two, because there's no one way that says you have to write research questions first and then develop chapter two. You may have an idea based on your years of doing literature review and some coursework that you're doing, and you may have some information in chapter two, and therefore it's born from the foundation of chapter two as well. Research questions offers provide evidence for the theoretical framework, which you're going to create in most cases in chapter one as another section. As I mentioned, one of the prior sections I recorded was about the theoretical and conceptual frameworks that are found in a chapter one and in your proposal as a whole. The theoretical framework may come from your questions because if you are doing a study, for example, in some sort of current process improvement effort, I would find some ideas linked back to Frederick Taylor, perhaps, or Dr. Deming or Dr. Duran in your theoretical framework. And therefore, there's this connection, again, between your research questions and your theoretical framework. It may not be obvious. It doesn't have to be obvious. It doesn't have to be literally stated. But the good consumer research will help to see this. This may be why, for some of you, you're concerned that you send some information into your dissertation chair and get some feedback and then the next time you get feedback on something else. That could be because little by little in what I call incremental gains your work is maturing and the connections then are noted or not noted and then you have to bring them in to be. So it's not uncommon early on that you're writing one section at a time but as you get deeper into the whole chapter coming together then we see it as a entity and we have to start looking at the connections. Again, keep these short and to the point. The questions don't have to have a lot of verbiage in it. They should be very easy to understand and very simple. This is a situation where more is not better. Use least amount of words as possible and keep it exactly to the point within research context. And I'll share several examples with you later in this lesson. Now I'm going to talk about research questions specifically for quantitative studies. So in quantitative studies, ideally, you would have one dependent variable. Again, this is doctoral dissertation research. You put two dependent variables in there, you may be opening yourself up to something you really don't know what you're getting yourself into. Matter of fact, I will not take on a mentee who tells me he or she wants to do more than one dependent variable for a doctoral dissertation research because it's too much. Ideally, you want to, be able to keep the study clean and then have one research question per independent variable. As I mentioned, earlier one to three are ideal you get a little bit more than that becomes a little bit more concerning as I mentioned I did have one student who had 11 independent variables but that was okay it was easily written and being able to still have a clean study because each individual question was able to be answered based on the outcome of the null hypothesis testing so ideally again keep your question simple to the point Ideally, keep your study to one dependent variable and perhaps one to three independent variables. These should align with the purpose statement content. Here's another connection. Ideally, in the purpose statement, when you talk about the purpose of the quantitative correlation study is to determine to what extent each independent variable influences or has some impact on the dependent variable, if you have three independent variables, in the purpose statement, you will have three research questions, one per each independent variable. If you're writing your research questions first and you have three independent variables, somehow they need to be articulated back into the purpose statement. Again, we're seeing the alignment here. So when people start talking about the research alignment of the method and design, it's throughout all these sections. And early on, it may not be as noticeable 
that there's gaps in it. But as you create your work and get closer and closer to a refined product, these connections become more important to make sure that they're there. If you're applying an intervening variable, include that into the research questions. For example, if you're going to do some sort of leadership study and you're going to do it in sixth grade, for the teachers that are in sixth grade and they went through a specific program, that specific program might be the intervening variable. So you want to include that. Not all studies will have intervening variables. So you'll know if you have one or not, and if you're not sure, then you'll probably be checking with your dissertation chair or he or she will let you know. But if you have the intervening variable, then include it in the research question in this section. For quantitative, here's an example that I'm going to share with you right now. Two examples actually, but the first one is written in a manner how I would expect to see it. To what extent, if any, and you have to say in the proposal, if any, because if it's a quantitative, there may not be any correlation statistically testing there may not be a correlation so you have to put this in there and this is again the consumer research in many cases I'll see people write to what extent is there a correlation but by missing if any I believe they're not being specific enough it tells me they may not understand research as well as they think they do or they don't think that this matters which it really does so in this case to what extent if any is there a correlation between one independent variable and then that dependent variable and then it would continue on in that unit of analysis perhaps that location. You may find the exact same information written a little bit differently in the sense that it's articulated with different word choices that happen first but here it's to what extent and it does the independent variable correlate to the dependent variable. There's no one right way there are probably three or four other ways you could write the exact same research question and that may be why for some people it's so confusing but if you're not sure then review that lesson in your research courses go online if you need to to find more information or just get a tutor many of my students have had to have tutors to be honest with you I had to have a tutor myself when I went through my dissertation proposal and dissertation writing because I didn't understand it as well as I do now and I still don't understand it 100 percent but at least well enough to be able to let me do what I'm doing now isn't that a comforting factor right now for you so let's go on to the qualitative now I'm going to talk about qualitative research questions so if you're doing qualitative work you'll understand that there are no variables in qualitative work there's no variables because there's not one thing compared to another if you're going to look to explore or examine something there's no variables there again here you want to have your research question aligned to the method and design so if you're doing perhaps a qualitative phenomenological study phenomenological studies are designed specifically to help us learn more about other people's lived experiences so the research questions should be written as such where you're trying to identify what are the lived experiences of whoever the survey population is in regards to the phenomena that the study is about. In qualitative work we look to seek to explore. We discover those lived experiences. We learn why or how something happened or is what it is why it is that way. So as we start to look here, we're not able to see any variables. We're just looking to see what happened. And we can only do that by perhaps observations, perhaps discussions, interviews with people. Uh, sometimes we have to literally sit down and do those one-on-one -on -one interviews and ask what their lived experiences are. This would be much like seeing an accident. If there was four or five people who saw an accident, they're all going to recall it a little bit different just because of one's own filters and so we can't really test the hypotheses here and we'll get into later. there's no hypotheses to test and there's no variables you're just asking for people to share what they perceive happened if you're going to have a qualitative study oftentimes we do want to know what people's assumptions beliefs or perceptions maybe their values or observations or what they hold to be true about something that we're going to ask questions about but in essence of keeping a clean study if you're going to ask let's just say their assumptions beliefs and perceptions have three research questions one per each you may caveat under what are the lived experiences and then 
by having interview questions that talk about assumptions, beliefs, and perceptions, you can do the analysis work that way. There's nothing wrong with that. I do prefer to have, in this case, one research question for assumptions, beliefs, and perceptions because for me, as I mentioned, it makes it a cleaner study. But I've also had mentees who have incorporated it all into the central research question of what are the lived experiences. Again, it may be more dependent on your doctoral dissertation chair or how much you know or don't know, or perhaps even somebody who reviews your work at the university. Now I'm going to talk about hypotheses. Now there's a hypothesis that means one or hypotheses that means two or more. For the essence of the discussion here in this lesson, I'm going to talk about hypotheses in the plural form because it's easier to say for one thing and often the case where there's more than one anyway. So this is for only quantitative studies. As I mentioned, qualitative studies do not have hypotheses because there's nothing to test. Now, if you don't have a good understanding of hypotheses, some of the information I'm going to share with you may be a little bit confusing. I'll do a little teaching on the topic, but not much. The hypothesis, or the hypotheses, if you will, are the educated guesses. It's what we believe to be the outcome of the study. It's what we expect to come out of the data that we have. It's a prediction. It may not be true, and we can't prove everything, we can't prove anything in most cases because when we're doing quantitative work, when we're doing a survey, unless we can get it to every person, there is going to be some chance that the findings are not going to be correct. So we make a prediction. We can't prove anything. If you had 50 employees and you interviewed 50 employees or perhaps rather gave them surveys, you might be able to have a greater level of confidence, but still, we may not know exactly if somebody's going to be truthful in their answers. So that's why a lot of times if you start to read as a consumer research where somebody else has written something about how a hypothesis proves something, you'll probably learn that there's probably more problems in that article or that piece of information that you're reading because the true researcher would not say that we have proved anything. That's why you see a lot of times you say data suggested, the findings suggest and that's the true representation, if you will, of the research context being put together well. In almost every case of every bit of research that I've done, and most people I know of, with the exception of perhaps some scientists, there's usually an anticipation of the outcome of the study. We pretty much know what the outcome is going to be. We're using our data to be able to help support that premise that we have. The beauty is that sometimes we do get information that is not what we expected. And I'll give you an example from my personal dissertation. I did my doctoral dissertation on the cause and effect of a corporate wellness program on employees in a company in Honolulu, Hawaii. I pretty much expected, as you might as well, that people who use the fitness center were more productive they would have less sick days, that they would be more efficient in their work, that they would be better employees than perhaps if they weren't using a fitness center. Well, some of my data started to tell me that many people had more sick days from using the fitness center. And that was like totally unexpected. And that was the beauty, the nugget that came out of it because then it helped me then to look more into the information and what we found out is that some of the people who were using the fitness center didn't learn how to use the machines and the equipment and actually hurt themselves. They may have sprained an ankle or they may have tore a ligament or strained a muscle and they had to go have it looked at and then had to take so many days off of work for it to recover. Well, that was a piece of information we didn't expect and sometimes that's the value of doing research. In almost every instance, when I get to an oral defense, I'll ask the student, the doctoral candidate at that point, what's one thing that came out of the study that they didn't expect? Because that's usually the one thing people remember the most. And to be honest with you, even for my doctoral dissertation, other than the interviews I did with the people, because I did a mixed method study, that's the one nugget I learned. And that's the real value for many of us in doing research. In the hypotheses, it's a supposition of the outcomes of the variables. That meaning that you know 
to a certain degree what you're going to get out of it based on the variables of the independent to the dependent variables that you have some clue about it and and you think what the findings are going to be and so as you create your hypotheses you're actually writing them in such a manner to provide that supposition if you will ideally you will have one null hypothesis per research question now here we go back to the concept that I mentioned about a clean study if you have three independent variables you should have three research questions and you should have three hypotheses and three null hypotheses this is what I call alignment because when you test a hypothesis particularly when you're doing the statistical calculation of the null hypothesis how you answer that is going to be determined how the research question is answered that then goes back to provide information to help lessen the specific problem that you had written about for those stakeholders Null hypotheses articulated in a manner that suggests there is no relationship. Just as the alternative hypotheses are written in a manner that shows that there is a relationship. And this is important. It's important to know because we are going to test the null hypothesis. Matter of fact, as I'll mention in a few minutes, I don't even care if my mentees put in the alternative hypothesis. Because when you start to get into your work, and this is where... I don't have enough time in this lesson to really teach you about why you test the null hypothesis, but when you're writing the hypotheses in your chapter one, you have to make sure that you're writing the null hypothesis. Statistically, you'll see that you're going to test the null hypothesis and you don't need that alternative hypothesis. Now, some doctoral dissertation chairs in universities will expect you to have both the alternative and the null hypothesis. There's nothing wrong with that. I've seen them both ways. I tell my mentees I don't care whether they put the alternatives and I've never had one denied because it wasn't in there. We test the null to suggest that it is likely wrong as compared to testing to suggest that the alternative is true because we already believe that in our own mind that what we're looking at is going to be true so we want to statistically show that the null hypothesis is tested and again if you don't fully understand this because you haven't had all your research courses yet or you didn't focus on this enough then that should be a clue to you in your self-reflection to say okay now I need to go back and learn more about research question designs particularly if you're doing a quantitative study of course if you're doing a qualitative study this doesn't matter at least at this point but you should still be well enough informed to be a good consumer of research there are different what we call significant levels for testing of hypotheses so when you're testing the null hypothesis depending on the significance level that you use will determine the findings and while you don't have to worry about the findings in chapter one oftentimes in chapter two you may get a dissertation chair that says now that you put the hypotheses tell us how you're going to test it for significance and this is what they're asking for and if you don't understand what the numbers here mean and what the differences are other than the normal mathematical differences between them then you might want to look that up in your research book on significance levels for testing the null hypotheses there's really only two outcomes with hypotheses and I've seen it written many different ways and this goes back to being a consumer research you either fail to reject the null or you reject the null there's nothing about the alternative there's always an opposite needless to say if you fail to reject the null that's going to cause something on the alternative to happen but because most people don't care about the alternative we don't say that or if you were to word this differently and say that the reject that the null hypothesis failed to be accepted that to me would tell me perhaps you don't understand research enough and this is where again the alignment of the research method and design and the right research context and terms need to come into play if you're getting a lot of statements from your committee members about the way that your wording is applied towards your hypothesis or research questions this may be exactly what they're looking for it may seem minor to you and may seem like it should make no difference that is incorrect thinking because everything needs to be very specific it needs to be on task with research context and the connotations of word choices again we're not proving anything because we're sampling so when you start to write information about your hypotheses and the testing of it please don't use the word that you're trying to prove a hypothesis or disprove the null hypothesis that's not what this is about here's an instance where 
perhaps a little teaching will come in and talking about size does matter. And it matters in the sense that some dissertation work needs to have enough people in it to be enough points of data to run a statistical analysis. And I'll, I'll give the application of perhaps you may have a company with 50 people there and you want to survey 50 people. Well, statistically, you're probably not going to have enough points of data for the statistical calculations to show anything significant or substantial. This is why for many dissertation chairs, we put a number on it. For example, my mentees, if somebody wants to do a quantitative study, I tell them they need to come back with at least 125 usable surveys. If they can't, then I don't want to work with them because that's not going to be what I call dissertation worthy. It's not, going to, not to say that 50 people is not good research. It certainly can be. It's just what I believe not to be equivalent to significant or substantial for a dissertation. If you're doing a qualitative study, most people that I'm familiar with will ask you to state that you're going to interview 20 people or until theoretical saturation or theoretical data is achieved, which is a calculation that tells us when we can stop because there's no new information. If you're going to look at a small sample size because that's all you have, you may want to talk with your dissertation chair and see if that's acceptable. I know a couple of universities that won't even accept a dissertation if it doesn't have enough return surveys. And in some cases, the survey response rate may be only 20%. So if you only have 300 people, you may not even have enough to be able to get that information from. But then there is that fair share sampling formula which you can use and that may help to substantiate why you can do with less than 125 and still be significant and substantial. But again, that's beyond the means of this lesson plan here. What I want to be able to do is share some examples from some of my mentees on how they wrote their research questions and their hypotheses. As I mentioned, my doctoral mentees have gone through in most cases on their first pass at the proposal and dissertation. This was more because of their doing than mine, but a team works together and between the committee members, the student and myself, we were able to get their work developed in a manner that would be professionally accepted. Each student's work that I'm going to share with you here, they have given me consent to be able to use their work. They own the copyright. I'm just sharing it here as I am with my own information and what we call brain tithing, where we're sharing information to help you as we hope then you will do for others once you have the opportunity. So the first example comes from Dr. Maria Puente. Her dissertation is titled Selling the Lived Experiences of Domestic Property and Casualty Insurance Leaders. The example of her research question is what are the lived experiences? of domestic property and casualty insurance leaders with respect to selling. Because she has a phenomenological study, we see the alignment with lived experiences. And so therefore, the research method and design are aligned in her research question, as well as the nature of the study section. And it also goes back to her purpose statement. In the second example from Dr. Ellen Beatty, she has a quantitative correlational study institutional characteristics and endowment investment performance following the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Now hers, you'll see here, I put not only the research question, but I also put her hypotheses as she wrote them. Again, it starts out with to what extent, because she's doing a correlation study. Now she didn't say if any, because this is a, an approved dissertation. We already know there is a correlation because she's done the statistical calculations. So we we're able to take that out. To what extent is there a relationship between institutional characteristics and endowment investment performance? Now we see the alignment of her hypotheses where it goes in no significant relationship exists and then she has the alternative that says a significant relationship exists. She wanted to have both of them in there and I was fine with that. But if she didn't want to put the alternative hypothesis, I would have been fine with that. Her second research question goes well because she had two independent variables. So this is written the exact same way except it has the second or the other independent variable in the question as well as in the hypotheses. You see it follows true to form. There is no difference in how they're written with the exception of the independent variables being changed out one from the other. In Dr. Joseph Hagee's work, 
his dissertation is titled Influence of Religion and Religiosity on Leadership Practices in the Workplace, a Quantitative Correlation Study. In his work, we see the same ideas are written out. Research question, to what extent are the leadership practices of organizational leaders based on their religion? And then the null hypotheses and the alternative hypotheses. Again, see how they're written. There are no significant differences. There are significant differences. Now in his work, he also showed a figure. And I think this is great to have a figure in your work because it helps the reader in many cases because oftentimes a figure or a picture is worth a thousand words. So when you start look at the independent variables, you start to see how his are written and how he shows pictorially how he looks to compare the one or the correlation between them. And he even goes as far as to talk about his independent variables on one of them being a nominal scale and one of them an ordinal scale. So the picture comes in handy. Now we had in another research question what are the differences if any exist. Now here he talks about in the hypotheses particularly in null hypothesis no difference exists and then significant difference exists. So the difference instead of what correlation here he's looking at differences but in practicality from a research perspective changing out extent or differences doesn't matter because it's how the questions were worded in the survey which allowed him to have this connected in such a way that he has here. Now Dr. Patricia Schroeder and her quantitative correlation study of individualism, collectivism, and employee innovation in Turkey provides her four research questions I wanted to share here and you could see the first three are pretty much the same right? To what extent was there? To what extent was there? To what extent was there? Now, in question number four, you'll see this is written as such where it could potentially be answered with a yes or no. Were there significant regional differences in culture, leadership perceptions, and self-report creativity of Turkish employees? In general, I would say it's probably not good because it says the question in a way it could be yes or no. But once you start to see here that research question number one, number two, and number three were statistically calculated, she was able then to take number four and have statistical information support the answer for a number four. And this is a little bit different than a straight yes or no answer because she's grounding it in the statistical testing of numbers one, two, and three. And then the final example I want to share with you is from Dr. Susan B. Kristiniak her dissertation titled Exploring the Experiences of Complementary Therapy Nurses, a Qualitative Phenomenological Study. And in her work, this is the entire research question area in chapter one that you see here. There's nothing more. It gives you a great example of how sometimes less is enough. Very specific, she just opened it up with the qualitative method for studies phenomenological research attempt to explore the following, whether the perceptions of nurses integrating complementary therapies related to their nursing care delivery and what are the perceptions of nursing using complementary therapies. That was it. And then she went with that final sentence there, you see, the identification of nurses perceptions when integrating complementary therapies contribute to their practice of revisiting holistic and care opportunities and therefore affecting perceived satisfaction in their profession. So you don't always have to have a lot of information in this section. You just have to have what's important and what's needed. Again, much like the research questions themselves and the hypotheses, if you have them, keep them short, keep it to the point, and then move on. Tested statistically so uh, for reliability. And then there's information about my membership site online.